What is up, all of my beautiful freaking people? Welcome back to another episode of FML Talk. Today, we are diving in with my guest, Megan Murphy, who just came out with her new book, Your Fully Charged Life. This woman has been through the ringer and back more than a few times, and I cannot wait for you guys to all meet her. So sit back, grab a friggin' cocktail, and welcome to FML Talk. Oh my god. Wait, how old was the other girl? 19. Can you believe that shit? Hey, this is Gabrielle Stone. Good book. I did not in chapter 6 <gasps> He did what? 48 hours? What a dick. Yeah, but have you seen all the photos on her Instagram? And this is FML Talk. Oh no, she didn't. So before I bring Miss Megan Murphy on, I want to first thank all of you FMLers for all of the love and support. All the DMs that I got after the Fear of Abandonment episode dropped was just really incredible and overwhelming. And I am so glad that you guys are here with me each week and resonating with the stuff that I am talking about. I say all the time that I was forced into doing this podcast, but I'm so freaking happy that I was because it has been so awesome to continuously connect with you all week after week. And I'm so thankful to be getting just as much out of it as everybody else seems to. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Apart from talking about Megan's book, she shares with me a lot of really intense stories and one of which she went through in her childhood, and I won't ruin it for you, but when I was listening back to proof this episode, one thing kind of popped out and smacked me in the face, uh, probably because I just dealt with it last week in my life. And so often we go through our lives and we don't feel like we're in control. Um, it's a human feeling. It's a normal feeling. Um, when I went through my my 2017 FML story, um, I felt like everyone else was in the driver's seat and I was just flailing around in the back of the convertible, like holding on for dear life. But as I've grown and healed and learned more about myself, I've really taken away one massive thing that I want to share with you all. And it is simply this, do not stress or worry about things that are out of your control. And I know everyone's like, okay, Gabrielle, that's so much easier said than done. Yeah, I know I say that to myself too sometimes. But when you can really, truly stand in your power and know that you're being authentic, know that you're being a good person and doing everything that you should be doing. And you still can't control something, it's at that moment where you need to step back and be like, okay, check check my things off the list. Am I am I doing everything I should be doing morally and as a good human and you know how I want to portray myself and doing everything that I know is right in the situation? And if you are and the other person is still reacting a certain way or feeling a certain way. You have to be able to let that go. You cannot control the way other people perceive things. So a week ago, I'm going to be kind of vague with you guys just for, uh, you know, some, some people's privacies. I was in a rather tough conversation with myself and Tay and his ex-wife. And, you know, we, we got through it. Um, but in the midst of that conversation, I was so frustrated because I was like, okay, I know that what I'm saying is, is valid. I know that what I'm saying isn't overstepping for anybody. I, I know that what I'm saying is, is correct in this sense. And it was so frustrating to me that she wasn't able to see where I was coming from. And it was at that moment that it was like, okay, I can either sit here and continue to be pissed off and frustrated and let my anger boil inside of me, or I can step back and be like, okay, I've said what I needed to say. I know that I'm not in the wrong right now. So whatever is causing her to feel disrespected or 
upset or whatever the experience she was having was no longer in my control. So all I could do at that point was like lay all my cards on the table and say my piece and make sure she knew that she was being heard and that I was validating her and then to just let go because you you literally cannot control the experience that someone else is having. I mean, you can scream it until the cows come home, but if they're not ready to hear it and they're having a different perspective in the midst of whatever you're going through, you're never going to fully reach them. And there's no point in staying in the shit of that conversation, of that energy, of trying to force something to resolve itself when the other person is having a completely different experience than you are. So I I took a step away and was like, okay, you know, I've done what I can do. And of course, then as life always imitates art, I go back to proof Megan's episode and we start talking about this really heavy situation that happened between her and her friend when they were in high school and how tragic it was and I'll wait to get into the details for her to explain everything but she was so hurt and so wishing that the parents on the other end of this whole story could have just seen her perspective and her heart and there it was impossible because of what they were experiencing and what they were dealing with on their end the whole situation looked vastly different than it did to Megan or it did to an outsider and i think for me that's the biggest takeaway from this episode is that when you're in it when you're really in it sometimes you can't see what's right from what's wrong and sometimes you can't see something that would normally make total sense because you're so plugged in to the situation. But looking back on my own personal situation this this last week, um, I took something really important away from that other than the fact that you can't control other people's experiences and other people's perspectives, so to not force that. But More importantly, I took away really knowing who I was. I I walked away from that and I was like, okay, I don't feel bad for anything I said. I am proud of the way I handled myself and the way that I defended certain things in my own personal life. And it made me proud to be standing there as the woman that I have become. And I think what's so beautiful about Megan's journey is that so many different things in this life kind of broke her along the way. And she almost fully cracked at one point. And then there was a moment where she went, you know what? No, not going to fucking do this with my life. And was able to not only turn it around, but become insanely successful, write this unbelievable book that so many people are like really really resonating with because it's written in such a simple and like effective way where you can really get it and it was another affirmative example of like take the reins of your life stand in your power be authentic and then just let go of control because there's nothing you can do about it. And so many times in my life, I've lived in that strife of trying to control other people I was dealing with and the way that they were perceiving things and like forcing things that they weren't capable of seeing from where they were standing. So as I bring Megan on to share her incredible journey with you, I invite you to look at your own life and see where you can give up a little bit of control. Megan Murphy, welcome, welcome to FML Talk. Yay! We're so happy to have you here, girl. 
really psyched to be here. Yay. Um, there's so much I want to cover with you. You have had such an interesting life is the best way that I can put it. I When I started reading up on you and about your story, it was like, I, there's not a lot of times where I'll look at people's stories and say, oh my God, they've gone through it like I have, you know, um, with the amount of stuff. And I, I feel that way about you. Oh, well, I've always made my mess my message and it's gotten me pretty far in life. So I'm thankful for all of those gifts of adversity ultimately. Although during the time, I'm like, really? Really? Right. Again. Your life is bitch slapping me again? I love it. And I think that's so cool. You've made your mess your message. That's that's a great fucking sentiment. Isn't it? Right? I it's love my, that. one of my bumper stickers. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we get into all the exciting stuff that you have coming up, uh, like your book that I cannot wait to read, um, I want to talk to you about kind of like where all, I guess, the shit show, as you would say, started, yeah. um, where the adversity really started. So why don't you take us back to the first really kind of like traumatic experience that you had? Sure. So I grew up in the New Jersey suburbs, pretty middle class, average family of five, brothers and sisters, the whole nine. My high school years were tumultuous. Um, I you know, had a lot of emotions. I was a really raw kid and so much of it was misplaced and it, it turned into a raging eating disorder. I was really good at being anorexic to the point that um, my body failed me. I was a soccer player. I passed out on the soccer field, rushed to the hospital, admitted to an eating disorder program. The real tragedy in that is my best friend and I were what I called tandem anorexics. We were like partners in no eating crime. We worked out for hours, discovered laxatives to, mm. you know, together, egged each other on, wore matching outfits and had matching empty lunch boxes. Right. Like, and how we old were, were you at this time? 16. Okay. 15 and ultimately 16. So our parents were also best friends. And when I was admitted into that eating disorder program, convinced her parents that she needed the same kind of help. Unfortunately, en route to the hospital and to the inpatient program, my friend jumped out of the car and died. Mm -hmm. Her body was so weak and so frail, she couldn't sustain the impact, and she died. So wow. now I'm in the hospital, having just spoken to her on the phone to convince her that this was not so bad. Yeah. Like, just join me. We'll, we'll fake our way out of this, too. We got this. Like, just come join me, whatever. Ugh. At least I'll have company in my misery. Um, so then I'm a 16-year-old dealing with the guilt um i blamed myself for her death and in this same respect was trying to get healthy yeah. um it was hard i wound up moving out of my house once i was out of treatment and moved in with my aunt and uncle um you know an hour and a half away to finish high school because i just couldn't face people i couldn't face um reality you know, what had happened in reality yeah did you ever talk to her parents after that well, it got pretty, pretty crazy because so one of the way I'm a writer and um, one of the ways I move through things and, and express myself and process things is by writing. Yeah. And I wrote an essay about the experience and won a Horatio Alger National Scholarship for overcoming adversity, mm -hmm. won $10,000 and a college scholarship was subsequently on an NBC special and Don, Don Cost, Don what do you call him, Bob Costas and Don Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, where the host and Trisha Yearwood performed and I got all this national attention. And then subsequently YM Magazine at the time called me and was like, we'd love to tell your story. And I said, great, I want to write it. Well, I did. Um, and there were pictures of us and the full story. Um, and it was just too much for her parents to yeah. take at that point. Initially, they were encouraging and supportive and, and commended me on my bravery and just wanted to see me get better. Mm -hmm. But then when this became so public... They served me with court papers for defaming her. Oh, Ultimately, no. it. but can you imagine now this is my best friend. These people who had yeah. been supporting and cheerleading for me now are trying to sue me. And in the process, an unauthorized, uh, I don't want to say the net, but an unauthorized TV movie was made right. about our experience. How is that possible? Like without consenting like, any like, of so the So they didn't involved? name us by name. They told our story. Okay. Our exact, like... If you had read any of the articles I had written and, right. and had, you know, seen me speak, like, it was our story they without just our names. didn't say it was you, right. Exactly. But everybody knew 
who it was, what it was about. That was incredibly hard for her parents. And that was incredibly hard for me. I was not a fully formed human. I mean, obviously, I I mean, to become like emaciated, passed out on the soccer field anorexic, like I wasn't in good mental shape to begin with. So this was hard. And this was a long journey through. And I was in therapy and I was getting some of the resources to get better. But one of the things I even talk about in my book is at that time in the early 90s, psychology was really focused on what's wrong and how to fix what's wrong Mm -hmm. not what happened late in the later 90s with positive psychology where it was more like what's right with people and what helps them flourish right so all the work i was doing was fixing a problem it wasn't giving me the tools to live what i now call fully charged Mm -hmm. so i'm moving through the crap and i'm and i'm slowly moving through the crap but i'm not okay and i'm not I'm just not okay. I've, I moved I've on. I've so been there when you're like, you know, I'm taking steps forward. And especially from an outside perspective, you're like, oh, well, people, you know, you must be doing better. You're healing. And you're like, yeah, I guess I'm, I guess I'm healing. But like, I'm walking right. through literal shit right now. <laughs> well, and that was the thing. It's like, okay, her weight's up. Okay, that's a marker of success. Well, okay, that's a physical marker of mm-hmm. success perhaps but that had no there was no comment on my mental state I mean I gained weight because you put me in a hospital and you force fed me yes I right. gained weight I was not okay I was absolutely not okay I mean I had to move out of my house and live with my aunt and uncle because I couldn't face high school mm-hmm. and my parents were loving supportive incredible people but they didn't have the tools and now that I'm a parent myself with three kids I understand why they didn't have the tools right. this is hard to this is hard to navigate mm-hmm. and it's heartbreaking for a parent and you know if my dad were alive today I have so many sorries um but I moved you know I began to move through that and I began to get on with my life and I found a lot of purpose in um making my mess my message it was very healing for me I didn't understand that's what I was doing but I wound up being hired at YM Magazine and I had a body positivity column, um, which was really like me helping to rally other women to feel good about themselves for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, That really was a source of power for me um, and healing. If that I can help other people and step outside of myself, and I think that's so true in life, anytime you step out of yourself, outside of yourself, um, and help others, the benefits are wild. Yeah. Um, so I found purpose with that healing message. Um, and I had some success in my career. Um, so I was working at YM Magazine and ultimately I was an on-air correspondent at MTV. And then I went on to be one of the founding editors of Teen People Magazine. Um, and then I went on to Cosmo. And it was while I was working at Cosmo in my 20s that I had what I now would call one of those bullshit aha moments in that Mm -hmm. I was writing and researching an article called The Seven Secrets of Happiness. Mm -hmm. And in interviewing the positive psychologist and looking at the research, I was fascinated. I, for the first time in my life, realized that being happy is bullshit. Doing happy is everything. Mm, I love that. that. Right? It's that be happy. That's that's like an Instagram bullshit platitude, right? Yep. But I finally for the first time began to realize that misery is a choice just as much as happiness is a choice and there are positive action steps I can take on a regular basis to inch toward happy Mm -hmm. and I had a very strong negativity negativity bias my nickname as a kid was grumpy I was predisposed (sighs) to be miserable I had I wore a gold necklace with a grumpy charm on it oh my Um, god I was that kid. Like, I don't want to go to Disney World. It's hot. There's lines. Right. Um, we're totally going to lose a soccer game. Everything sucks. Like, <laughs> I could find, like, everything was half empty. I mean, I'm, and I've completely transformed my life, which is what I, that's what I need to share with people because I can help everybody do it. Yeah. Um, it was a long journey for me, but I've got the toolkit now. So, moving through life, getting, a, like, starting to have some of the tools and resources to become a happier you know, more evolved human, right? Um, And then worked for many years at Cosmo and then went on to Self Magazine, which I call sort of my self-actualization years. I'm a certified trainer and I I was the deputy editor of Self Magazine and the fitness director. And I ran a program called the Self Challenge, um, which was for nine years, I helped people reach their goals, their soul goals, their body and fitness goals. And I found so much joy once again in helping others. Mm-hmm. Anytime I step out of myself, I'm better for it. Right. Um, and in those years, as I was helping others, you know, a lot of the tips and tricks and strategies were rubbing off. I was happy enough to find 
my husband, who just happens to be my brother's best friend. I um, love that. <laughs> right? We got married. We had three kids. Um, moved to the suburbs. I started then at Good Housekeeping. My career usually mirrors my life stage. But the second I moved to the burbs, of course, I'm working at Good Housekeeping. When I'm young and single, <laughs> of course, I'm at Cosmo. Um, and at that time, I got bitch slapped with some more adversity. Um, my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and died within a five month span. Ugh. And my dad was my everything. He was my guy, my go to, my cheerleader, my champion, and yeah. now my cardinal. Um, and damn it, that really took the wind out of me. It was, and I always believed everything was possible and that the world was rooting for me because my dad was rooting so hard. Aww. Anything I ever did, it was like high five, gold star. You rocked it. You know, yeah. like I was a cub reporter at a newspaper and I wrote an article about an exterminator and like he framed it in huh. the basement huh. and anything we did. Right. I mean, so God bless that man. I miss him every day. He left a gaping hole in my heart. Mm-hmm. But what he gave me was this gift of confidence and possibility. But when I lost him, I didn't know how to function for a hot second. I had and you three had, kids. Yeah, you had your kids then because when my when yeah. my dad died – my mom was it was just her and it was like you can't you know I've had a lot of grief in my life and I'm I I curl up in a ball for you know a week or whatever you need to do but when you have kids you can't you don't have that luxury you have to live for them and that was what was hard because like I could move through the grief of my friend in my own way on my own terms Mm -hmm. I I got to be selfish this time around I had a five-year-old a four-year-old and a two and a half year old Mm and no choice and a job and a house to run and a commute and all the things Mm -hmm. um and i really dug deep and created something called operation good grief and in that moment and it was just an exercise in finding one thing that didn't suck every day i love i I truly mean didn't suck yeah i when you when i first heard about this i was like this is gold um, for anyone and you know I think it's for anyone that's dealing with any kind of grief not like the heavy you know if you're if you've lost someone even if you're struggling through a breakup like this or is you gold. lost your job you, yeah you like lost your freedom with a pandemic like this yep. is this is I rewrote the recharge resilience chapter about grief in my book when COVID hit because it mm. ultimately initially it started with my me moving through grief as in death grief mm-hmm. and I realized in that moment we were all experiencing pandemic grief more yeah. loss than any of us had ever known in so many ways even kids mm-hmm. loss of friends loss of freedom loss of school yep so i was and i lose my train of thought but i was talking about grief <laughs> but, so no. operation good grief started my brain works too fast my husband calls I, it a hamster on a wheel and he's like where is the hamster going <laughs> and i'm like oh wait okay pause operation good grief but but it truly was an exercise in Finding one thing that didn't suck every day. And I think that's very important because when you're in it, it's not about finding fucking rainbows and unicorns. It's like, what doesn't suck? Yep. Like, legitimately, what doesn't suck today? And, like, maybe it's, like, my cute sweatshirt with a lightning bolt or my fun pink glasses or a compliment I got from a stranger. Like, what's one thing, don't even call it great, that just didn't suck so hard? Mm -hmm. And I, I actively prioritized positivity, as the research would call it, and found that thing. And I took a picture of it and I shared it on social media with the hashtag Operation Good Grief. And what that did was a lot of things. It made something positive forefront in my own mind Mm -hmm. and allowed positivity to surface, which all the research says can lessen the blows of the negative. So it softens the edges of the negative and ultimately can cancel out the negative if you make it loud enough. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. And I also created a community around this movement. I created all this support for myself that I didn't know I needed or wanted, right? So people were like, what is Operation Goodreath? What's going on for you? Oh my gosh, my father died. My mother died. Right. I lost my son. And I and I had this support system of people who were going through grief. I established grief mentors. People who could show me what it looked like to get out the other side because I wasn't sure I could. Yeah. Um, and I kept that up for two years. That's amazing. And it rewired my brain. It yeah. It changed the neuroplasticity of my brain. Well, and another thing that it was doing was forcing you to be actively looking for that one good thing you could post exactly. today. And when you're open to looking for the good things, so many more of them start to trickle in. And it's funny because when you, I mean, it, it's just physiological. Our negativity bias is so damn strong. Your body wants you to find the negative. Your brain wants you to see the bad. 
you have to fight that. I mean, I think of, if you think of your brain as like a trail, well, the trail most people traverse is the negative one, right? So it's well-worn, the brush is cleared, the rocks are cleared, and you can walk it easily. But the second you take the different path, right, then you have to work a little harder to create that path. You break down the sticks, you break down the rough, you know, you get through. But once you keep traveling that new path, eventually it's a new path mm -hmm. and it becomes the one you travel. So after two years of this, like my brain completely rewired for the positive. Yeah. I mean, I fucking feel like I shit rainbows sometime and I'm not even <laughs> trying hard. But it was this very simple exercise and eventually... I didn't want to call it grief anymore because I felt like there was like, I moved through that. I want to call it the yay. And it sort of morphed organically into the yay list and what asking people, what made you say yay today? Mm. Asking, asking my kids, asking my family, asking myself, not what doesn't suck. What made you say yay today? Yeah. And it's essentially gratitude in practice, but writing in a gratitude diary or gratitude journal, journaling to me, I, I it's so positive and it's so wonderful. It feels like homework to me. It doesn't yeah. work. So creating a yay list, posting it on Instagram, sharing what made me see yay today, it, 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 that clicks for me. Totally. And from working with people on, on the self-challenge and helping some, them to reach their soul goals and whatnot, I found that this kind of technique, fun filtering some of the advice and really distilling it with actionable, practical applications, yeah. makes it more useful and accessible. Absolutely. And can you talk a little bit about what you mean by soul goal? So a soul goal is like something in your gut that you want to achieve. Okay. Something that matters, something that has deeper meaning beyond. For, so for me, I was coaching people to lose weight and to eat better, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the real, that's not the soul goal. That's not what actually right. matters. That, those, are the, those are the vanity metrics. But what actually matters, right? That's what I was also coaching people to find. Why do you actually want to do any of this? Mm -hmm. To be more present for your family, to have more energy to tackle some hobby or, or volunteer. Like what matters to you beyond vanity metrics? That's in, crucially important in anything. Absolutely. Um, let's go back for a second to your time at Cosmo. <laughs> um, were there any sort of like ridiculous FML stories that you, that stick out in your brain that you like, oh my God, can't forget? <laughs> well, I will. So I wrote the Aqua Sutra, which was a waterproof sex positions book. Um, Stop. And, oh yeah, no, totally. I, I have a couple copies in my, oh my God. I don't know if it's, I might have a copy here, but it was like <laughs> physically waterproof. And in order for the illustrator to illustrate these positions, like, um, I don't know, there was like the surfboard snuggle and like stupid ass shit. Oh I had God. to, with my coworker, pose in the positions so that they could be illustrated. Oh so like my I would God. have to get in these, I don't think you could get away with this now. I'm sure that there would be like, sexual this harassment is, laws yeah, against that. yeah but like we literally like would mount each other take polaroids and send them to an illustrator like that happened oh my god okay we are going to take a quick break because i have some news so i don't know about you guys but i deal with serious anxiety and i have finally found a product that has really started to help me Sugar and Kush uses CBD in all of their amazing products to give you a really helpful way to chill the fuck out. I started using their gummy bears before bedtime or whenever I was feeling anxious. There's zero calories, zero sugar, and they're all natural so I can take them whenever I want. And their super cute packaging on all their stuff is just an added bonus. The vanilla cupcake bath bomb is now a staple in my self-love cocktail and one of my go-tos for a relaxing bath at night. And they have tons of flavors and amazing products on their site. And because they now know that I'm a fan, they gave me a 20% off code for all of my FMLers. You can check out all of their great products on sugarandkush.com and use FMLtalk20 at checkout for 20% off your order. Seriously, you guys, these gummies have been a game changer for me, and I hope they help you as much as they've helped me. All right, let's get back to the show. Oh, my God. So, that's I mean, maybe brilliant. that. that that's, I, I mean, I literally would mount my coworker in sex positions for an illustrator. Fantastic. That's, fu that's fucking great. Um, do you think... <laughs> Do you think what you've been through um, with the anorexia that led to your friend's tragic death that, you know, spawned 
you know, do you think that manifested anything specific in the way that you handled relationships throughout your life? Interesting. Um, yes. I think that it's hard to be my friend. Mm. Um, I am friendly. I am friends with everyone. But it's hard to deeply, deeply, deeply be my friend. Um, hard, and that because, mean, hard because you keep people at arm's I length have, or hard for them because of what you've gone through? I think hard for me to fully allow people in. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean I'm... I'm endlessly kind, endlessly loyal, endlessly reliable, um, endlessly generous. But there is, uh, there's a piece of me that it, that still feels like my best friend died. Right. And I don't want my best friend to die again. Yeah. Um, I've also have the luxury of a sister who's 18 months younger than me, who knows my history, who knows my pain who is my first call right. and my lifeline. Yeah. So being able to share along with my sister also has kind of allowed me to be protective about my deep friendships. Yeah. And so when you met your husband, how do you think that changed? What What was different that well, you were able to let I'm so him freaking lo- like So I've known my husband since he was in second grade. Oh my so, God. Yeah. Like I'm four years older than my brother. Um, I'm the oldest. I sometimes function like the youngest because my sister and brother were married before me, had four kids each before me. Like they're just a little bit more socially evolved. Mm -hmm. I I was like, they were doing like the suburban things and I was like, "Mm, not so sure. But my husband is four years younger than me. So growing up, it was like, I'm a senior, you're a freshman, gross. We went to the same college. I'm a senior, you're a freshman, gross. And then we were all like living in... and, and. I set him up. I put at my sister's wedding. I'm like, had my best friend sit next to him. Like, you should hook up with Pat Murphy. He's the best guy I've ever met. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, try to get every ex girlfriend he ever had a job. Like, always loved him. Yeah. As like another family member, but ne- I was like, ew. He's so, like, you know, when you're right young, it's like that's gross. Like, why uh, would I want someone younger? Now I realize I could only have someone younger because who in the fuck could keep up with me? Right. But. <laughs> Um, but it was like years later where my brother was living in Hoboken. I was living in Hoboken. You know, timing was right. We both happened to be single and we would meet at my brother's for Sunday dinner and my brother would cook for us. And I just started to realize that he made me nervous. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a fucking Cosmo editor. Nobody makes me nervous. I talk right. about blowjobs for a living and I'm going to tell you <laughs> what to, where to tie that necktie. Like that was not, like this shouldn't make me nervous. Why is he making me nervous? And then I'm like, oh my God, he's reading. He was reading A Million Little Pieces and I was meaning A little, a Million Little Pieces by James Fry. And I'm like, and he fucking reads? He's not even, he's that hot and he's not stupid. What is going on here? And then eventually um, we um, had like way too many cocktails at like a lesbian dance night um, at oh a restaurant God, in Hoboken. It. And I like put my hand on his thigh and I'm like, and and we just went and made out in the corner. <laughs> and the rest was history. But we secretly dated and hid for quite a bit because I was like, I didn't have a very good track record. I never really mm-hmm. wanted the fairy tale, the husband, the three kids, all the things I have. Like, I didn't aspire for these things. I love them. I'm grateful. I'm so happy. But it wasn't like I I lived for these things. Right, right. Like, it wasn't on my radar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my brother was like, "There's more." When he finally did find out, because someone saw us making out, we made out everywhere, like ATM <laughs> machines, bars, like we just, because the secrecy of it was so hot. Yeah, right. You're like, "Oh I my god, it. I can't have you. I want you more." <sighs> um, but my brother was like, "There's one good outcome. You get married and you have three kids, and I don't see that happening." And then it happened. And my brother's best man speech at our wedding was pretty much the best thing that ever happened because he was like, "And I was wrong." Aww. And now my best friend gets to be my brother officially. Aww. Like it was, I love that. it was, re- it was so good. So I got that part right. Like, um, and I think obviously I had my dad and my mom modeled for me true, true love. Um, I got really lucky as much as I effed up because I hear a kid out my door. I'm going to say effed up now instead of the <laughs> bomb. Um, I did, my parents really modeled love and strength and mm-hmm. confidence and all the good stuff. I just, you know, was hopped up on hyper emotions and really f my shit up. Yeah. But I knew what a good relationship looked like, and I knew if I was going to have a relationship, I was going to have a good one. Yeah. Um, and my husband is the perfect partner in crime, and I don't know how I would function without him. 
Oh, I so love that. What a fun story. That's I know, so I cool. Saw, it's one of those things, it's like where you almost feel bad saying, no, I really love my husband. I got it right. Yeah. You know? But and I, I really the, didn't even pay attention to him for the first 20 years. <laughs> right? Right? Like, I was like, oh, he's hot and smart, but like, ew, he's younger. Oh my God, too funny. I'm not going to like that when I turn 50 and he's like still in his 40s and being like, haha, but right now I like it. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so let's talk about your freaking book, girl. Yeah. Oh my God. When is, when is it coming out? Um, well, this is, so just so like the adversity front, this is what cracks me up. So I just got through COVID. Me, my husband, my three kids, and my 70 year old mom all got bitch slapped with COVID three weeks before my book's about to come out. Oof. Um, which is why I feel like I always have this gift of adversity before big things in my life. Right. Um, and I used every strategy in my book to get through it and to cope and, it was just a good reminder of how important this book was for me to write and I, I think how helpful it will be, be to people. Mm-hmm. It's called Your Fully Charged Life. Um, love the title. It. Love the title. Love the cover. It's like orange, yellow writing. It's all loud and in your face. I love With it. lightning bolts. With lightning bolts. Um, but it's a radically simple approach to having endless energy and filling every day with yay. Um, and it really looks at... Um, the different areas of your life and how to operate at full battery and optimize them. It starts with the positive charge, like how to retrain your brain to more automatically see the good and really how to prioritize positivity and why that's so damn important and something so simple as reframing a crap situation from like, why not me to why me? Mm -hmm. I mean, from why me to why not me and empowering yourself with these positive action steps and thoughts how you can propel yourself forward to live this happier life and it's not a big change it's just a tweak in thinking um the work charge looks at how to not be an asshole and find a job you love and to have Mm. purpose and passion into the love charge is about moving through the world with kindness and establishing charging stations all around your neighborhood and those charging stations are cashiers and baristas and ups drivers people who have the power to give you a boost a boost of positive energy and you sure. have that power to give that to them how to be a better friend neighbor wife sister cousin you name it i love um, that the health charge is really about like why you should move your body and why you should protect your sleep and how that helps everything function better yep the extra charge is about being a little extra um, <laughs> I love right? that. Like why fashion and beauty can matter and home decor can matter and making your bed can matter and buying yourself flowers on a Monday, even if it's a $1.99 bouquet of carnations, can matter. Yep. And I back it up with all the latest in research and science. So basically I lived this and then went backwards and found all the research to support why it works. I used myself as a guinea pig mm-hmm. for 25 years as a service journalist and then said, okay, this worked for me. Why the hell did that work? And now I have all the science behind it. And I think you'll love the recharge chapter, which is all about resilience um, yeah. and getting through tough times tougher, becoming love better that. for having gone through it. So it's um, basically a book that the entire planet needs to read so we can all move through our shit and start being happy and nicer to each other. <laughs> I mean, that's the goal. And I think the the thing I, I want to stress to people is that you're not broken. And I absolutely am not trying to fix you. But... Tomorrow could be more awesome. You could be happier and you deserve happiness. I think there's this, you know, people think it's frivolous to want to be joyful, to celebrate, to look for the good in life. And it's not frivolous. It's necessary. It is so important now more than ever. And I want to give you permission and the tools to find yay, to find joy, to make tomorrow a little bit better for you and the people around you. I so love that. What a great message to be taking out into the world. And it's so needed, especially in the climate that we're in right now with all the injustice and unrest and the fear that like permeates our world right now, especially Mm -hmm. after 2020. It's, It's so necessary. And I think what people don't often realize is that because it feels so big and so worldly, it's like, well, I can't control that. I can't do anything about that. But if you can start recharging how you put exactly. your yourself out into the world and and what you're giving off then it really does it's a ripple effect and it starts to affect the collective consciousness and we can all start to do it together to start making some major shifts in our world 
I think that's the key. And it's all about like thinking small to affect big change. Mm -hmm. It's it's not about what you're going to do tomorrow. It's what you're going to do right now. Practicing being present, affecting what you can in this very moment, because every positive action is has a ripple effect. If I do good now, if I choose the positive thought right now, that helps me and enables me and empowers me to have the next good thought and do the mm-hmm. next good deed. Yep. And, and it's it's contagious. And that's the only thing I want to be contagious right now. Right. <laughs> kindness and gratitude and love. And that's not... I, I think I always like to say to my, my naysayers, because I'm not everybody's cup of tea, and that's cool. Um, you know, be a coffee drinker. That's fine. But the the thing is, it's also not toxic positivity. And the thing I want to say to people is that it's not about looking on the bright side only. It's about looking at all the sides, but then allowing yourself to feel that sun, right? Yeah. So understand and acknowledge what sucks. Yes, you have to do that. I can watch the news and cringe and cry and rage. Um But that can't be the only thing I hear. As is, I can't just see rainbows and unicorn. You do have to take in the entire picture. Mm -hmm. It's not about this toxic positivity. It's about understanding what sucks and that letting that, you know, inform your purpose and Mm -hmm. drive you to the next positive action step. Yep. I love that. And that's important. The whole toxic positivity thing, that's, that's a good note to remember because I think there's a, a, certain culture of people out there right now that are like very focused on it's always positive it's gotta you know you gotta stay in that mindset and that's not healthy either like toxic positivity is a real thing like the fact that you know if you're being met with this is how I'm feeling and I feel broken and I'm sad and I need to grieve this well yeah but like you're gonna be fine and like the you know there there is such a thing as like making people come out of something quicker than they need to Um, So I'm glad that you you pointed that out. I mean, even the moment I was diagnosed with COVID, I mean, there was a whole moment where I allowed myself with grace to Mm -hmm. be fucking pissed off. Yeah. How the hell do I goddamn, me and my entire family get COVID three weeks before I've got to launch a book. I'm the editor-in-chief of a magazine. I have a, like, I don't have time for this. Right. Like, damn it, I'm mad. I was mad at my husband for a hot second. Did did you, was it because you went to the eye doctor? Why do we have, how'd this happen? You know, (laughs) like... You have to have that moment of yeah. whatever you need to experience or feel and say out loud, this fucking sucks. Yeah. Allow and yourself to be angry about it. Ex- be whatever you feel, sad, angry, like confused, nervous, like whatever it is, feel the feels, feel all yeah. the feels, but you can't get stuck there. And the key to not getting stuck, to unstick you have to do positivity. You have to do yeah. one thing. You got to find Whatever your yay. That is, you have to find your yay. <laughs> yeah, I love um, it. That's the secret. So where is your book available? Because by the time this airs, it will be out, I'm assuming? It's out February 23rd. Yes, so it's um, out. <laughs> so it's it's out. Um, it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I always like to say to people, though, I'm, I'm the chief spirit officer of my town. Um, I'm like a real love local shop local. If you have a local bookstore pop in there ask them to order it if they don't already have it I mean yeah yay Amazon yay Barnes and Noble but I mean if you can you know I always say like anytime you buy or shop local a real person does a happy dance I'd love to make Aww. as many real people do a happy dance as possible I love that um but and I just recorded the audiobook which I almost didn't get to do because of my COVID I they had to cancel the recording and push it to the last second so that was super exciting and a dream come true to for me to be able to read my words out loud it's therapeutic, um, isn't it, to go back and it was read so, your work and I out listened loud. to I, I loved I listened to you as like a amp up before I had to oh. record, and I was like, okay, I can be me, I can be raw, I can read, because like, you owned your words, and like I just needed that permission to know I could do that too. Um, oh, that's awesome, dude. Because I Thank didn't know you. what to expect. I'd never like, and so you freed me up. I didn't listen to anybody else. I'm like, okay. Oh my God, that makes my whole day. Um, I so appreciate that because when I went in to record my audiobook, I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, yeah. I've never had an audiobook recording class. Like, I didn't even do voiceovers. So I went in and was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to read it as the way that I it sounds in my head when I wrote it. And totally. I get so many compliments on people that are like, oh my God, I loved that your voice cracked and that I could hear your emotion in it. And it's like, because that's what people resonate with. They don't want to hear like this 
monotone voice reading the story to them well i thought of you there were two exact moments where i got to my first like shit and i'm like because in print there's an asterisk for the eye got it because okay. penguin random house didn't let me write the word shit so then i'm like oh, i do i say it out loud right yes i say it out loud yes and, i love it yeah and then I started crying during a part where I was talking about my dad. And I'm like, yes, you just cry and you choke up and you wipe your nose and you get through it. Yes. Um, Hell but you yes. gave me permission for that. So thank you. Oh, my God. I so love that. That makes me so happy. I cannot Yay. wait. I'm going to listen to the audiobook when I when I dive in. That's what I, that's the way I'm going to choose to do it when I listen to yours. <laughs> it's fun. I'm like, my mom's like, I'm going to read it first. Then I'm going to listen to you talk to me. I'm like, okay, mom. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Um, okay, it's so very tell... surreal for me because this is the first time it's in the world. I'm like, yeah, ah, no, it's, it's like my you... heart and soul on paper. It's like you've birthed another baby. It feels that way, yeah. and I've made magazines for a million years, so like it's just different than yeah. putting out a magazine. Like even if I'm the editor in chief, like no, it's this your is soul. like this is this was giving birth. Yeah, I got I stretch marks so... from this one. I so know what you mean. <laughs> and I've never even actually given birth to a real child. So, um, all right, my love, tell us again, uh, tell us again the name of the book so everybody can go grab a copy and then where we can find you on social media. Sure. It's called Your Fully Charged Life. Um, and I'm on social at Megan B. Murphy with all the letters because my mom is extra and so am I. It's <laughs> M-E-A-G-H-A-N B. Murphy. My my middle name, fun fact, is actually the letter B. Everybody always oh. wants to try to give me a period, but it's not. Um, on Facebook, I even have a period because it won't let me change it. But it's my it's legal just name is Megan B. Murphy. Like, yeah, just be. Be you. Be free. Be Oh my God, I love it. Be anything you want to be. Yeah. That, she I knew right from the start. Name, right? She knew right from the start. <laughs> All right, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on FML Talk. I'm so excited for, for your book to be out in the world. And thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Yay, I'm grateful for you. Thank you. You too, girl. All right, it is about that time. We are going to get into your FML stories. Hey, guys. My name is Haley, and this is my FML story. So I was dating this guy on and off for five years, and in those five years, I have now recently found out that he has cheated on me, manipulated me, lied to me so many freaking times. And I never knew about it until just now. Every time we would fight, it would just automatically be my fault. He would make me feel like a complete disgusting human being for even having feelings. And come to find out at one point when we were supposed to get married, he ended up canceling. He ended up going into the military and was deployed in Germany and decided to tell me that he ended up marrying a guy that he had met in Texas when he was last stationed there and wanted to marry him for BAH so that he can get extra money and that there was no time to quote unquote marry me and move me out there so that we could get married even though we planned this for so many years and then I ended up breaking up with him because he wanted me to drop my whole life and move out to Texas with him after he got this quote unquote divorce with this guy and dropped his whole savings to get an apartment with roommates that I have no idea who they are and how this apartment is just so that I could be with him. I couldn't take any more so I left him. And the one time that I leave him, he starts making me feel like crap about how I left him randomly, that I hurt him. But now he's dating a girl named Kaylee and has been with her for months and has proceeded to try and have phone sex with me, has tried to get me to get back together with him, has tried to get me to change my whole life to be with him, even though he is with this girl. And all the while dealing with all of that with him and all his drama and I end up meeting this guy named Timothy who was at the time of Friends with Benefits and I thought that was going to turn into something and he ends up being married as well but is currently going through a divorce and that's a whole heaping drama in itself and will act like a boyfriend but won't commit. And all the while, I am back and forth on getting hurt left and right by two guys that do not seem to give a shit about me. But I am now losing weight, going into the military, 
and living my best fucking life and listening to these podcasts and listening to everyone's stories has made me realize that even though we go through a bunch of bullshit dealing with guys and their drama or dealing with girls and their drama that we can rise from all of this and surpass all of this and even though I now still am struggling with my trust issues and my trauma dealing with narcissists and drama queens in the long run I know that Gabby has been through shit as well and you guys have been through shit as well so it makes me feel better knowing that I'm not alone in this so I really hope that you enjoyed my FML story and I love you all girl I can assure you you are so not alone in this um I feel like both of those men were red flag city uh, especially the first one I mean there's a lot to unpack there with running off and like marrying a dude um for starters it's it comes back I feel like to us knowing our worth demanding that and never settling for anything less than that there's so I mean we need to just do a whole episode on fuck boys because I feel like every fml story we get is um at the nucleus of it is a fuck boy so maybe we'll just craft an entire episode on that but thank you for being a badass and rising from the ashes and taking the leap to join the military and serve our country. You go, girl. Hey, Gabrielle. I have an FML story for you. It's the story of when I lost my virginity, so buckle up for this one. I was 18. I held on to my virginity until then. I was dating this guy who I couldn't see was awful or I didn't want to see was awful. And he invited me to go up to his parents' house in another state with some of his friends from his school that... I didn't really know for the weekend. I was very excited. I was hoping to lose my virginity at this point. So I was stoked. The day of the trip, he starts crying and giving me this story with major red flags regarding like infidelity stuff. I should not have gone on this trip, but I went anyway. And lo and behold, the girl he mentioned to me was also going on this trip and going in our car with all of us. I should not have went on this trip. I should also preface before I get into this that I have problems pooping in public places and so trips were always very complicated for me. We were not even there yet and I already had to poop badly, like badly, badly. So we get back to his parents' house where we're staying to take showers before we go out for the night and I'm like, yes, here's my chance. They'll never know if I poop before I shower. So I start pooping and it's a lot, like a lot, a lot. And I get off the toilet and I look at it and it's huge. Like it's massive, disgusting. Okay, so I flush it and the toilet starts to overflow. My pants are around my ankles and I'm audibly yelling, no, 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 no. And the water stops at the very top of the bowl. And I've already been in the bathroom like a suspicious amount of time at this point and I still had to shower. So I didn't know what to do. So I just took my hand and I just reached it right into the fucking toilet and I karate chopped this turd over and over and over again and I shoved it like down the hole of the toilet. It was like I was murdering it. It was like it was a murder, a murder of my poop. (laughs) And then I look and there's so much poop over the bottom of the bowl. Like I had to wipe it clean because it just looked like I took a butter knife and just like spread shit all over it. Like this is literally my nightmare. I finally finish. I'm mortified and I have an armful of shit and toilet water. So I get in the shower and there's like no water pressure, none. I don't even know how I got clean, but I did. I got through it. I went to the party. I decide I'm going to lose it to this douchebag. I don't tell him what happened at his mom's house. And we start and I have to stop because my stomach was still so upset from holding in so much poops. So I run to the bathroom. I projectile vomit all over the mirror. I attempt to clean it. But then I realize I'd smell like it. So I just I just fucking left it. We did the thing. It lasted 20 seconds. I didn't tell him I puked. The next day I leave to go back to my home state and he calls me to break up with me because he decided that he couldn't date an actress, which was my profession. And fuck my life. That's my story. Love your podcast. Love your book. Thank you so much. Yo. (laughs) I'm sorry, you guys. I'm fucking legit crying right now. Um. I love all of you guys equally, but for those of you that have submitted FML stories before in the past, this one quite literally shits on all of them. 
I cannot imagine. I mean, we've all felt the panic of when the toilet doesn't flush, but like to be in that situation, to know that you were about to do the deed for the first time. I mean, fucking A, girl. And then the vomit. Oh, my God. I mean, they say your first time's going to be memorable. You just really took it to a whole new fucking level. And I salute you for it. I want to thank Megan Murphy for coming on at the Mel Talk and sharing her incredible story. If you guys want to check out her book, please do so. It's on Amazon. It's called My Fully Charged Life. Please check it out and put some of her incredible wisdom into your own daily practices. Next week, you guys, I am so beyond, I don't even have the words honored, excited. I I can't wait. Kelly Randis, who is not only the best-selling author of the book Spilled Milk and so many other incredible books, she's also my mentor. So the reason why I had the balls to self-publish and go on this freaking journey in the first place is very much in credit to to Kelly. Um, She is also had one hell of a life. It is going to be a heavy episode, but it's going to be so fucking good. Um, She went through what no child should ever have to deal with, and she is now a hero in her advocacy work bringing awareness to childhood sexual abuse. I cannot wait for you guys to all meet her. As always, make sure you guys are subscribed so you never miss an episode. Catch up with us on Instagram at FML Talk Podcast. We are so close to getting a few new merch items up on the website for you guys. I cannot wait for you to see them. It is above and beyond anything we have normally done. And the You Fucking Can and I Survived a Narcissist designs will both be back in stock because they sold out quick and I know people have been asking for them, so we heard you. They will be back up in the next few weeks. Until next week, guys, have a self-love cocktail on me. Cheers. Cheers.